Welcome to Go Lurk Yourself, a podcast about streaming on the internet. My name is Crunky. And I'm Freddy. Freddy, or aka College of Celiac on Twitch. How you doing, Freddy? I'm doing well. How are you? I didn't know we were going with real names. Oh, shoot. Sorry. <laughs> Just don't call me Rob. Shh. Okay. <laughs> anyway, guys, uh, this week, as you can tell by the title, we are going to talk about Fire Emblem Three Houses, which Sunny D has played a little bit, and College has played, what do you think? 20 14 hours. 14? Uh, yeah. I honestly thought it would be more than that. Um, I've only been streaming it, so. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. It's hard to get uh, big chunks of time out streaming, isn't it? It's a lot of work. Yeah, <laughs> just a bit. <sighs> so, before we get into the new game, let's talk about other games we've been playing. Um, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, Freddy dragged me into GTA 5 online again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were playing, I logged into his stream, what it was, a Wednesday maybe? And I think so. And he was, he's playing uh, in a casino. Yeah. Because that's they have a real in-game economy that you have to purchase money. And so, of course, they're going to let you gamble it away. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I've made like 200000 in the casino. Yeah. And what did you do with that money? Uh, well, I spent like 100000 of it on clothes. <laughs> and then the rest is in my bank account. And it's going to go towards the penthouse upgrades. So I, I, I log in. I've never played GTA Online. Well, I say never. I think I played it once when we just ran around and shot people up and, you know, did GTA stuff. Of course. And I log in, and they, you actually go through this, like, tutorial. I still I, I filled that format. I never got my penthouse. Like, I log in, it's just not there. Oh, really? I must not have done something right still. But uh -oh. um, every time you go in there, you get one free spin on this, like, wheel when you walk in. Um, and you can win, like, money and and other in-game bonuses, but I didn't tell you this yesterday, uh, last night college, I won the car. You won the car? I won the <laughs> Are the you kidding car. me? It's like the rarest thing on there, isn't it? I literally logged in today and I only won 20 grand. <laughs> I, I love the statement, I only won 20 grand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in GTA money, that's nothing. Right. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was kind of fun. I, I'm not a big gambler, but it's just kind of silly to run around and then we, we end up doing a mission in there too right we like chase yeah. some getaway car because when you own the penthouse it unlocks like a bunch of missions for you and it's, it involves uh cheng who i think is in according to romeo and like looking at the screens because i don't remember the story mode very well mm -hmm. um he is one of the characters in the story mode and they're oh, kind of okay. just fleshing out his character a bit more to yeah. further solidify that he is a math addict <laughs> i played this through the story mode of gta 5 like at release I think I played it on PS4, and uh, I, I enjoyed it. It was it was okay, but I, I generally shy away from the big open world games because I get lost. But yeah. luckily, that one is like the, here here's all the other stuff you can do. But here's the story. You can, if you just want to do the story, go here, go here, go here, and it tells you right where to go. So that's my kind of my kind of open world game is like I can get sidetracked, but I know how to get myself back on track if I want to. Yeah, that's fair. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. Have you played much more of the uh, of the online? Uh, so I played online a lot when I was younger. Um, mm -hmm. I was actually able to transfer over my PS3 character, Oh, okay. which like I had the original. So around like 2013, I want to say whenever I got the game, I'm not sure when it released. Uh, I was like 15 or 16. I'd gotten oh, okay. it for Christmas that year. And then I logged in and within three hours of me being logged in online, hackers had given me 40 million. Oh, wow. So I was level like zero and I couldn't buy anything but I had a ton of cash so most of my apartments and stuff were because I was able to level up enough in like the first week before they took away my money that I was <laughs> able to purchase a bunch of the bigger purchases so all that was able to transfer over and I used to play it pretty religiously with friends and then it all kind of died down because we realized how much of a grind fest it is yeah I bet at the end it gets really really tedious yeah they added uh, a lot of stuff to make it less tedious because you can like run cars, you can run cargo, but it's still go here, grab this, bring <laughs> it back, take it here, sell it, and then that's it. Yeah, I mean, but at the end of the day, if if most games can, if they if they have any kind of length at all, have a bit of a grind to them now. Very true. Now, we have games like uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey that puts a giant grind in there, but lets you buy a way to skip. Oh, yes, of, of course. That's and I dirty. guess that they like shut down the map creators because people were creating XP farm maps. <laughs> yeah, I read about that last week. Yeah, they basically were, they were putting out these, uh, you know, kind of make your own missions. And it was just <laughs> it was a way to bypass the grind. Of that game. And they just wanted to shut it down. Ah. Yeah, you know, 
Yeah. It's not because that's making them a shit ton of money or anything. No, never. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Capitalism? What? So the other game that I, I think I saw you streaming before Fire Emblem came out was the, not Star Fox, what's it called? It's called Starlink. Okay, yeah, that's made by Ubisoft, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, is it, so is I got that Black Friday, and it came with the R-Wing, and it has like a little Fox McCloud that you put in it. Like November um, last year, Black Friday? Yeah. Wow. And it's been on my backlog for forever, because I didn't <laughs> yeah, think I'd like it. I didn't expect it to play as well as it does, or as much of like a Star Fox game as it does. So well, that's cool. Yeah, it's definitely very unique, and... I'm glad that I gave it a shot. They do have an $11 DLC or something that um, allows you to play as Falco and Slippy, I believe. Oh, wow. And I think that also unlocks the Star Fox racing content, which I know was like rumored forever. It turns out that that, as far as I can tell, is just in Starlink. Yeah, they showed. I, I remember everyone thinking, uh, seeing like footage of it and everyone thinking it was going to be a Nintendo title. Yeah. Like Mario Kart meets Star Fox kind of thing, but it's just ended up being a Ubisoft game mode. <laughs> When I watched you play it, it looked a bit like, um, what was that game? No Man's Sky mixed with a little bit of uh, yeah. Star Fox out in space shooting and stuff. Yeah, it's it's a lot like No Man's Sky with uh, the Star Fox dogfights. And then almost like, I mean, obviously you have to buy the weapons to get the specific effects you need for certain bosses, which kind of sucks. And I'm not going to do that. Like buy them but, the, like the in with real money? Yeah. Oh, that's dirty. Um. You can still beat the bosses. It's just not going to be as easy. And it did get a little tedious. It almost yeah, felt like, a little like Monster Hunter with that. But the boss fight was still pretty cool because you had to learn the patterns. You had to learn how to dodge properly. I, I just a lot really, of the game, you're yeah. on uh, the ground as a ship. Oh, yeah, because you fly around sort of like a No Man's Sky when you're when you're towards the ground. I That, yeah. that gave really... That, I was really interested in it until you just mentioned that Basically, they they incentivize you to to do microtransactions and buy buy guns. Like, well, it was supposed to be a toy to life game, but they've stopped producing the toys. Right. So instead of buying the toy, you have to buy the digital version of it. The toy exactly. Just to have it yeah. in the game. Oh uh, man, how much are the are the guns? Like two or three dollars each, or how much? Do they uh, cost? I think it's like a pack. You get like three for five. Ugh. <laughs> it, that's it. Just makes me want to throw up in my mouth a little bit. I mean, to be fair, <laughs> they did just put it on sale, like the starter kit for fifteen dollars on Amazon recently, and you got a fifteen dollar credit back with it. Right. So, almost a free game if you think about it. It literally is a free to play yeah. game at this point. With and it immediately sold out like that day. So yeah, they, well, because everyone wanted to try it, but they didn't want to drop exactly. $60 on it. But it was it was. I remember seeing them at the last year at the at GameStop. There was a like a sixty or eighty five dollar bundle for like yep. everything. That's ridiculous. But the. Uh... The Star Fox missions in that are like they play like Star Fox. Yeah, when I, when I saw you watching it, or when I saw you playing, I was watching you play it. It definitely felt <laughs> like I was I was watching like a modern Star Fox game, even though it's not. And I I accidentally called in Falco, and that uh that may have shocked me slightly. <laughs> I, yeah, I think I think the next two times it called in Slippy, and then it called in Peppy as well. Oh my god! It's yeah. Like, did you ever play the uh, any of the other Star Fox games growing up? Uh, so I played. I've played Star Fox 1 and 2 on the SNES Classic. Yeah, I'm sorry. And then I played the <laughs> Star Fox 64 port on the 3DS, and I played a crap ton of that. And there was one called Star Fox Assault, I think. For Was it GameCube? I think I saw, like, my friends played that one, but I was never allowed to play it with them. <laughs> you weren't allowed? Your parents were real strict about games? Well, not only were my parents strict about games, but it was also single player, so it was more like watching your friend play Star Fox ah, than okay, me yeah. playing it. And at that point, we all agreed, like, yeah, we would rather just play Kirby Air Ride. Exactly. Uh, so Star Fox 1 and 2 on the, well, 2 was never released until the SNES Mini came out. But yeah. by the time they had it ready to release, it would it would was going to be an embarrassment because of Sony's tech. It was already <laughs> way better looking than, than that. Um, Star Fox 1 was like a way ahead of its time. Like, it's obviously, its graphics look horrendous now. But oh, yeah, it's hard to play. Fully rendered polygons and stuff on on basically was it was it on NES or SNES? Uh, I think it was on SNES, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I, there was a version of it. I, I watched a YouTube video a while ago where there was a there was a version of it that ran on the NES, but it looked even worse than the SNES version. Oh no! <laughs> like a tech demo of it, but yeah, yeah it, those I never got into the old the old ones because I thought they controlled terribly. But the N64 one was great. I played the hell out of that one. 
And Star Fox Assault, you could turn into like a tank and stuff. It had, it had yeah. Some, like, all right, my friends art. definitely played that one then. Yeah, that's the that's the one. But that's what we've been playing lately, guys. Uh, Freddie, you want to get into Fire Emblem Three Houses? Oh boy. It's not Fire Emblem Three Colon Houses. It's Fire <laughs> Emblem The Three Houses, or, or you know, the three houses of the game. So, little backstory: I I've played a little bit of Awakening on the DS. Yep. But you know, we Freddie and I were talking right before we started recording that you know Fire Emblem has been around in Japan since like the literally April of 1990. Yeah. And there's I, I'm just looking at the Wikipedia page here, and there's like. 20 there different so releases. Many. I know. <laughs> like, um, it never hit America or outside anywhere outside of Japan until yeah. 2003. Because I guess like the Japanese, like the developers didn't mm-hmm. expect it to work anywhere outside of Japan. Yeah. It, it's, I read an article this. recently. They were shocked at how popular it's become in North America. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're like, we legitimately have no idea why. Oh, I, I read that article. They, they, uh, they think it has to do with the character showing up in uh, Smash Bros. Yes, I can like, see that. I could also see it because uh, XCOM became really popular here. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of like, I know that for me at least was kind of a gateway drug into turn-based tactics. So so, yeah, so what I see in this game, if you've ever played, you know, uh, XCOM or we, we, we talked about Wargroove last year uh, on yeah. the podcast, um, turn-based tactical strategy games are awesome and they're fun, but they, they always usually have a pretty like thin or generic story to them. Like, <laughs> Not triple this trope. One. This is basically a giant JRPG where instead of having turn-based combat like a, like you would in an old Final Fantasy game, you literally have a tactical fight. And it's, you also have to manage stats. You have to manage armies, weapons, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So if you if you're if you're scared of Fire Emblem but you're curious about them, I I think. Uh, the XCOM comparison is pretty, pretty uh, for the combat is pretty, uh, yeah, a good representation of it. But it's way more than that because you have to manage, like you, like college said, you have to manage all the people, uh, all their stats. You have to, you literally run a, a school, right? In this, yeah. One? So you run a class in the school. Um, you get to run around a monastery. You like uh, where everyone lives. You can explore, interact with people. I've heard it's kind of like Persona in that regard. It did remind me of that I watched D play quite a bit of Persona, but okay. uh, it's combat. This is, this combat's way more technical and slower yeah. than Persona's. More like a traditional back and forth turn turn base. Because even in your like day off, you're kind of trying to pr- get motivation for your students or level up their uh, stats so they can be ready for the next combat. You also yeah. have the option on your day off to go into battle, which obviously is a lot more just tactics based. I've always been, so I played Awakening and I did Permadeath because I don't know. That's where if a character, for people who don't know what he's talking about, that's where you're playing the story mode with a cast of of characters that all have personalities and dialogue. And if one of them dies, they're just dead. Yep. They're just, they're they're no longer in the story. Um, And I am doing that with this game. Thankfully, they have a rewind mechanic, which, sorry, Lorenz, for letting you die like three times, but um, (laughs) it's rewind time, baby. Uh. But in this one, you get to kind of just manage everything a lot better. Um, Even in the battles, you get to see where they're targeting you now, which helps me a ton because I know I can't push like my sniper too far forward without him getting targeted. And it does matter on how you move people in the turn order. Um, In on your Sundays, you get to start lecturing. Or, I'm sorry, on the Mondays, you get to start lecturing. And then those lectures, you get to determine specifically, like, what goals you want your characters to have. So you can take someone who is, like, specking into be a mange and turn them into a sword fighter, if you so choose. Yeah, the, the, the amount of management, stat management, and skills, and, and like, literally, there's a calendar. And I, I can tell how much you've, you're into this game and how much you've played it, because <laughs> I was watching you play it. We streamed it last night or the night before. I don't remember. I think you did I've both, streamed it both. Um, I don't remember when it was I was watching, but all of a sudden I was watching your combat and I couldn't keep up. You were like flipping through the the uh, <laughs> menus and through the battle so fast. I'm like, I don't even know what the hell is going on right now because it's super technical. And then the the way I the way I described this to some friends the other day in voice chat was that that if you if this tactical fighting is your jam and you like a great story, this game is like heroin. <laughs> 
Oh yeah, it's no, like this is literal crack. You can't get enough of it. Um, but that also can scare people off because they're like, geez, yeah. it looks like this huge commitment. What what I heard on a um a review is that each house can have has its own story, its own characters, yep. and you can you can like swap in and out from the other houses, but uh, is is like seventy or eighty hour campaign on its own, and it yeah. can have branches that you don't do the same each time. So like, it has a lot of playability. And if you want to see all the houses, you're talking two hundred and forty hours. I mean, that's, oh, definitely, that, that's because, a lot like, of uh, time I, to put into a game. I went straight to Golden Deer because I really like Claude and mm-hmm. I like the other characters. The only one I don't really care for in that house is Lorenz, and you know what? There's a reason he died three times. Um, <laughs> He's expendable. Send him he, out in the front. He's like, oh, I'm so noble. Yeah, no, screw you. <laughs> um, but knowing like that there's Dimitri who leads the other house, Edelgard who leads. Uh, so Dimitri's Blue Lions, Edelgard runs Black Eagles, and Claude runs Golden Deer. And I only get a little bit of a glimpse into each of their characters. But going through all this and like just being able to see them grow is insane. Right. And, and what that lends itself to, from what I understand, is that... Like let's say you you play your your golden deer is it golden deer yeah it's golden okay, deer. and golden deer is one of the titular three houses right so you yeah you play through that and and you get to know the other houses and, and characters over there as adversaries as like people exactly you're competing with and and they're but they're all still friends at least right now I don't right. know if that's gonna stay <laughs> well and and then let's say you play through there's a whole story a whole war that brews and like the way that all the the relationships are interconnected makes it makes a playthrough up from the other side like more meaningful. So like it's that a lot of the people that I heard talking about this game said that once they were done with the first campaign, they loved it, but they were super excited to go play the other campaign and see it from the other side, because this is not your typical story, you know, fantasy story where there's heroes and villains and then the bad guy loses in the end. It's, Three ha- three sides all have their reason for wanting to do what they're doing. Exactly, and they're, not, they're not nefarious, so it's like it's more emblematic of, of you know actual uh, you know warfare or maybe how it, how it would have been in, in the era this presents to be. Does it does it give a time uh, stamp anywhere um, in the game? It doesn't really give a time. You can kind of assume it's like medieval times. Yeah, and it's kind of obviously what I fantasy because there's magic, right? Yeah, the way I look at it is it's kind of like Game of Thrones in a lot of ways. Okay. Because there's not any one set main character. There so are multiple of... main characters with different stories, different reasonings behind everything that they do. And lots of um, boobs. <laughs> yes, there are lots of boobs. <laughs> um, I've never I've never watched one episode of Game of Thrones, but that's literally like the only thing I know really? about. Really? Everyone's like, don't watch it with your kids in the room. Well, yeah, you shouldn't either. watch that show with the kids in the room, but not just because of the boobs, but because there's like a lot of gore and the last four right. seasons weren't super great. Um, <laughs> yeah, the and they're all going to end up disappointed like me. Every, everyone's shat on the last season, but I, I didn't hear that the last four were bad yet. The so that, last four, you could start telling where they were like losing the books. But oh yeah, if I could compare this, the best way to Game of Thrones, like with each of the houses, Golden mm-hmm. Deer is quite obviously Baratheon. Um, the Blue Lions are actually Lannisters, ironic because they're in the north, and then the Black Eagles are probably the closest to Targaryen. So I don't know that that does anything if you don't know Game of Thrones, but if you know Game of Thrones, <laughs> I can confirm it does absolutely nothing if you don't know Game of Thrones because I don't. <laughs> but I'm sure the people listening that a lot of people, more people than don't, or more people than not, watch that show. So it's yeah, good. and then um, also to the point of it being like tedious and daunting to get into, they mm-hmm. do provide you options to have auto battles play out if you're only there for the RPG elements. Um, they also give you the option to, during the instruction, you have the option for manual instruction or auto instruction. So if you don't want to micromanage that, they mm-hmm. can take care of it for you and still have your characters be on track to properly level up to match the story. Oh, that's good. So that, like, if it's too daunting of a task to micromanage everything, you can like, yeah, skip this button or, or have them automate. Or if there's like a really easy auxiliary battle and you just want some easy XP, you can just be like auto battle and it'll speed through it for you. Oh, nice. So uh, you got about twelve hours until you said, or? Uh, probably closer to about fourteen or fifteen. Fourteen, yeah. And uh, and how far into the story do you think you are? Has, you said the big war hasn't broken I out am... yet. So it goes by a month based system. Okay. I'm almost through August in the game, and I think you start out in like springtime there, so probably around like April. Oh, so okay. I'm not very far. I'm still in part one. You're still in a few a few months in, right? Yeah, I'm only but a few it, months in. 
I, I know you're going faster than when you started because I've been watching yeah. you play it. Yeah. So because yeah. now I kind of know where I'm going. I they let you fast travel around the monastery, which helps a lot because that place okay. is huge. I, I watched you playing and I was like, uh, watched you run around that place. I'm like, is this is that like the hub world between all your battles? You stay there, or do you, are there other so places you go too? You do live at the monastery overall. Mm -hmm. Um, you are sent out on deployment missions. You can do the auxiliary battles, like I said, on your day off, or you can, um, at the end of each month, you have a class mission and you have to pass that mission in order to advance to the next month. Oh, okay. So when it's your day off, you have the option to explore, which is what I usually do at the start of the month because it has the most bonus events because when you're exploring, you're given a certain number of activity points. You can use that to train your students, train your own skills, take them to tea, take them to dinner, cook with them. Uh, you can go to the choir and sing with them. More stuff unlocks as you go. Uh, I recently just unlocked an option where if I go to the chapel, they have notes asking for advice. And if the students like the advice you give, it uh, boosts your relationship with them. There's oh. there's a whole lot. So that's one thing that you can do. And then in that, they have little side quests that you can go around and do, which I've been doing every single side quest that I have. Those refresh each month. So you really only have to explore once per month. And then uh, if you choose not to explore, you can go to lecture, which is a lot faster. You just choose a professor to teach two subjects. And any students that have that interest or that goal set will attend that. They'll gain motivation, which you use for teaching. And then uh, you can do the battles, like I said, or you can rest, which I haven't done yet. That refreshes a spoiler item later on, which I will not get into. And it spoiler. also... <laughs> it also... Uh, helps gain all of your allies motivation back in case you're like really low on motivation and you can't teach anyone. So you're in the monastery, when you're in the monastery, all the NPCs that are around that I saw you talking to, do they, do you have a relationship meter with all of them or just yes. like key characters? You have relationship meters with, uh, all the students and all the professors. The only oh, ones wow. you don't are the random guards scattered around and the janitor. Cause fuck that guy. Uh, actually <laughs> you do, you do have a relationship meter with Cyril. <laughs> I was just trying to make a joke, and I didn't, I didn't know there was actually a janitor in there. Yeah, no, there's a guy who's like, "Where did I put my broom?" And he's a real, he's a real jerk to you, like the first two months, <laughs> and then you find out that he's like the archbishop's apprentice, and it's like, "Wow, all right, oh, well, maybe that's why he was a jerk. Maybe he isn't the janitor after all. I don't know." But, he's but for every time I've run into him, he's like, "Hey, I've got this cleaning task to do. I'm busy." <laughs> Well, it sounds like you're enjoying it. Um, would you say you, you played Awakening? Did you play it all the way through? I played Awakening all the way through. Um, I was, like I said, dumb and played on permadeath. Mm -hmm. And I lost so many characters. My final battle had six total people able to fight. And I was lucky enough that I'd overpowered myself. Yeah. To the point that I could single-handedly take on armies with Krom like, paired with me. So anyone I lost was inconsequential as long as us two survived. Did did uh did that game or the the new game that you're playing now Three Houses did it have the the Marth and the guys from the original in it? Uh no. Okay. Was it Marth and who's the other guy? What's his Ike. name? Ike. Ike from Smash Bros. Now yeah. there's like eight. Fire they have guys like their own now. separate games. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was when we looked through that list earlier. I was I was looking at like the actual you know Famicom release of uh, Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light. That came out in 1990. Whoa. Um, yeah, and then 92, they came out with uh, Fire Emblem Gaiden. It's, these are all of it also Holy available cow. on Virtual Console, so I don't know if that means the Switch Virtual Console or not. Uh, I don't think Switch has Virtual Console yet. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, they're on the Nintendo Wii and Wii U Virtual Console okay. and the 3DS handheld game console. Wow. So there you go. I've got I've got enough on my plate with three houses right now. I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> if you got 200 hours to kill, you can go play. Yeah, exactly. Each one of them is probably 200 hours. Um, I know Awakening had to answer your question about like which ones are in Smash Bros. Awakening mm -hmm. had Robin and now Crom. Okay, yeah. I was going to say I know those four names and there aren't there two other ones too that are in Uh there's Corin, mm -hmm. who I believe was in Fates. Don't hold me to that though. Okay. Fates uh, was the sequel to Awakening if I remember right. I think they were separate again. I'm not yeah. entirely sure. They well, they all seem I, to like not be super connected, but also seem to have very similar tropes to each other. I want to say that Awakening and Fates. It, I may have the names wrong, but there were two of them that you could like 
play each side and then like the stories. Oh yeah. So Fates was split into two games. Fates was the one that split two. Okay, yeah. I was confused. Did the does the game mechanics from from Fates or the, or I'm sorry, Awakening that you played is it very similar to this one? Or it is, is this one much more fleshed out. It is pretty similar, but this one is far more fleshed out. Like there was no way that the 3ds could have handled me having armies on each of my units. Oh, gotcha. Have you have you run into any technical issues with it? I've I've read that some people have like I slow saw downs. a couple frame skips, but they were mm. so minor that it wasn't a problem. Yeah, it's not that kind of game. Yeah, where you have twitch accuracy and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I I saw people complaining about the the like kind of blurry static background shots too, and the when the characters I mean, are talking. But you're, those you're don't at the really characters bother anyway. me as much because they look like they're almost hand drawn. Yeah, I, I think they are, but they're like instead of being rendered into a, in a room, the characters are standing in front of like a you know. A, yeah, a, I have a, noticed a, a that. But that's picture. more so only on like the support stuff. Mm, okay. Uh, the battlefields aren't the nicest graphical detail by any stretch. But <laughs> right. you can also zoom in and you can see like each character with their army and the background will change depending on which tile they're standing on. Oh, that's cool. And it's it's very it's very much a dynamic battlefield. Nice little attention to detail there. Yeah. So who's your who's your favorite character so far? I mean, honestly, Claude. Claude. And that's, he, that's, he's the leader of that. Of he's the leader house, of Golden right? Deer. He's sassy as heck. He also <laughs> like hits on everyone. So he, it's probably funnier for the stream to have him on there too. Yeah, and then like he he constantly cracks jokes and is just sarcastic. And <laughs> I have been told that I remind people of Claude, and that's why they chose that house. There you go. So there Do, we go. Would <laughs> would you say, um, as someone who really loves tactical games, would you say the better part of the game? I and you know this is, doesn't really matter, but would you say the better part of the game is the story or the combat and and management system? So, so, so I'm always going to favor combat and management if it's mm -hmm. tactics. Um, I love the story so far. It is kind of like your typical fantasy trope right now, at least. Right. I don't know if that'll change. Um, but as far as I can sum up the story to the point that I'm at, there is a militant church and people are starting to rebel against them. And I don't exactly feel the best about being the person they're sending out to quell the rebellions. Oh, okay. Because you're, you're being put in a tough spot then. Yeah, because like one of the missions I had to do, we had to go kill one of the students' adopted fathers. Me being Oof. the dumbass that I am, I was trying to recruit that student. So I'm like, hey, you're going to come on the mission with me. Only then to realize, <laughs> oh, that's your adopted father. And, we, and you have to kill him now, or we have to kill uh, him now. So he, he ended up shooting his father. He didn't kill him, but he dealt him some damage. And they had like specific dialogue, so I was kind of glad that I brought him along. Um, yeah. And then the next one I have to take out. So there's a system in the game where you have crests. And apparently, according to the lore of the game, if you're of noble birth and you don't possess a crest, you can't activate your family's relic of power, which means you are disowned, essentially. Wow. Now, like, obviously, according to the story, this brother had some other issues beyond just not possessing the crest. Um, but this brother was disowned, stole their family relic, and now we have to go kill him. But I I was actually aware of the fact that this guy had a brother at the monastery. And said, hey, you're going to come help me kill your brother. So now I'm interested to see what his dialogue's like. So the, the, definitely the story does keep you like engaged. It's not like yes. it's just you know go out in the woods and kill five of these and come back. It's not There's just actual... a throw aside story because it does have meaning for every single battle that you do. Um, even some of the side quests are like, oh, the merchant needs help clearing the bandits so we can get more merchants in the store or at the marketplace. So I did from that. A, from a game making perspective, that's pretty incredible that how how interwoven all the stories have to be for this to work. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, for you to be able to play the game from because you're not forced to pick that one. You could pick any of the three houses. when you start, I almost right? went straight with Black Eagles. But that's what that's what Dee's playing, and, and yeah. she she said that quite a bit of of the game is voice acted. Is is it is the entire thing too? is voice acted? The entire game is voice acted. Every single character, try. even some of the random like guards and grunts like that you run into, have voice lines. Oh, did you hear about the voice actor that they're they're I pulling did. His dialogue out? Uh, so the main character that you play is Byleth. Most of his talking is just grunts and groans, and he's got. <laughs> I've seen him have a one of like line of dialogue. Um. That's the actor that they're pulling. So it's not like a huge deal by any stretch. Right. But, but I just, guess he breached his NDA. Oh, is that what it was? I thought he yeah. had some kind of like assault charge or something. Uh, as far as I can tell, he just breached his NDA by talking about his role in the game on Tumblr. 
Oh, wow. Yep. That's, so I guess he's probably not going to get paid. Uh, I think he's already been paid, but okay. I, I have a fi- They're just like, oh, yeah, we're hiring a new voice actor, and he's just going to be patched out. And then they'll, he's probably got blacklisted in the industry then. Um, I have no idea how that works. <laughs> I'm just guessing if a big publisher says, you know, pulls out your voice because breaking the NDA, you're going to be hard to get a second job. <laughs> I would assume so, but he's also got quite the like repertoire as far as I can tell. Like he was an oh, animator okay. for Cuphead. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Well, he's a voice actor and an animator. What a, I what think a, so. Let me double well, check here. <laughs> cause I, I saw this on the article cause I was like, Whoa, I'm playing that game. What's going on here? It, it seems to be. It seems to me like the the game is insanely detailed. It um, really is. Oh, I guess there are abuse accusations as well. Oh, okay. Huh. Wow. Well, hopefully, hopefully they get it taken care of and it doesn't hurt the sales. Because I, I think uh, Fire Emblem uh, Three Houses it probably won't go on sale at some point, and that's when it'll see some major sales. Because yeah. there's a lot of people. Uh, I, I I know it's an amazing game, but there's a lot of people I've I've heard. Just it's too daunting of a task to even to like get into it. Um, uh, and there, I would uh, disagree with that, but I'm also the tactics guy. So yeah, I, I, I'm not saying that that there's more people that are not going to play it. I'm just saying that like a lot of people that I know and talk to about video games a lot have said that to me. Like oh, I, I oh, just gotcha. can't get into it. Can't get into it. But yeah. Um, oh, so, sorry. He was an animator on Skullgirls and a Hat in Time. Oh, okay. Hat in Time. That I watched uh, Chishin play that. That was a good game. Yeah, I've got to play it still. But it's like a Mario. He also uh, uh, started voice acting in 2010. Did Dust and Elysian Tale, Smite, Octopath Traveler, and Maple Story 2. Oh wow, I know a bunch of those games. <laughs> <laughs> Dust and Elysium Tale. I think D played the half of that game. So we gotta we gotta take our bets now whether D finishes Fire Emblem at least one um, of the stories. Well, I mean, if she doesn't, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to try to convince her to. Exactly. You need to you need to tell her to uh I woman up. I almost said man up, but that doesn't work for my <laughs> wife. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and, and make an educated guess here that you would recommend this game. Oh yeah. Like so, full heartedly. Uh, yeah. If if you're if you're on the fence um and you and you think you think you uh you it's, any of this sounds interesting, you know, watch a few reviews, listen to what college has to say and and give it a try. I, I think I think there's an engaging story to be had there and the they they uh from what I've seen they really like handhold you through the learning early on. They don't they don't overwhelm you. Probably the point that it annoyed you at first, didn't it? Um it didn't really annoy me at first because I already it. played a fire emblem and I knew what to expect. <laughs> yeah. But there uh, there are a lot of mechanics to learn that are kind of thrown mm. at you, but after like the first month, you get an idea of what you're doing, and then they're. And he means in game month, not yeah, actual yeah, yeah. Month. <laughs> and then they get better about introducing like each week in game, um, new options for you. And oh, I'm nice. still having new options introduced, and I'm like 14 hours in. So. This reminds me of. Did you ever play Xenoblade Chronicles? I did, and you get a tutorial like 70 hours in. Yeah, it's it, because there's so much to cram into that game that like they they literally can't give it all to you right at front, or the first five hours would be that. Sort of like uh, Final Fantasy fourteen <laughs> online. Ironically, I've never gotten into Final Fantasy. Maybe if it was Tactics, I've heard that exists. There, but... Yeah, there is a Final Fantasy Tactics game. But yeah, they, they Final Fantasy is more turn-based JRPG. Yeah. The MMO that basically is is basically a prettier WoW. Is all it is. <laughs> um, it was better with you know more Final Fantasy theming. But if I was ever gonna get into an MMO, I'd probably just get back into Guild Wars two. Guild Wars 2 is a fantastic game. I, I, so I tell everybody that. It, I, it's funny because MMOs for me are like, I get into them and I play the hell out of them. And then one day I'm like, oh, I don't care anymore. Yeah, that happened with me with Guild Wars. I was like two years in playing like 500 hours. And then I'm like, oh, oh. I don't care. <laughs> oh, I don't care if I ever see this character again. <laughs> it's what happens when we grow up, college. Uh-huh. Well, College, if people want to find you on Twitter or Twitch, how do they go about doing that? Uh, you can find me on both cases at College of Celiac, uh, twitch.tv slash College of Celiac, or Twitter at College of Celiac. And then I'm also going to try to get back into YouTube soon, which is nice. also College of Celiac. Would that be youtube.com slash College of Celiac? It would be. <laughs> I happen to get just enough subs to get the custom URL. Nice. Well, I am also at all three of those social media sites under Crunky, K-R-U-N-N-K-Y. Actually, my Twitter is Crunky TTV because yes. some some kind soul created a Crunky account in 2010 that's never posted Oh, anything. wonderful. And, 
Yeah, I, I tried all the things to get it, uh, and I could, couldn't get it back. But. That's like me uh, trying to uh, rebrand to Celiac on Twitch, but then realizing, oh, there's an active Celiac account, but they only watch streamers. Oh, man, that stinks. Well, plus, you know, Celiac is named after a disease. You don't need to name yeah. after a disease. Hey. <laughs> it's already in my name. <laughs> right. All right, buddy. Well, I appreciate you being here this week and, and helping out with the co-host duties, and I uh, hope to have you back on soon if you like. Yeah, I'd love to. All right, guys, and with that, we'll call this episode uh, done, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.